everyone, and welcome to Tortoise's Global AI Summit. It's in fact our second AI Summit, and we hold it to coincide with the annual release of the Global AI Index. Um, in half an hour at nine o'clock, we're going to go through the results of the AI Index, what we're learning in what is a global race. I grew up in the age of the military industrial complex. It feels as though we're growing up in the age of the national artificial intelligence complex. And one of the things that the AI index does is to track what's happening nation by nation, where the pockets of uh, strength and growing innovation sit. And so do join us at nine for that session where we will look in detail at the data we've analyzed and uh, the actually very striking found findings uh, that we've produced. But we're extremely fortunate that this day of thinkings begins with a conversation with Sir Nigel Shadbolt. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a weird thing I had when I was at the BBC, Nigel, which is I thought to myself that we should have planted a reporter in the lobby because there were people who were just coming in and out the lobby. The, the wonderful thing about this year of the screen is that you don't even need to go to the lobby of the BBC. You can actually just click on your computer and suddenly you've got, you've got Sir Nigel Chappell, you know, and, and I know I sort of say it slightly, you know, with a certain degree of reverence, which is a little kind of um, hokey, but the truth is that, you know, if you're a journalist like me, you don't get to meet people who are the architects of the internet, the people who helped design what modern computing science is. So, we're really grateful to have you uh, kick things off with us. And, and what we wanted to do um, is do this in the spirit of our thinkings. They're like editorial boards, open news meetings. Um, I'm gonna put some thoughts to you, but I hope that all of those people joining us today, um, we've got nearly 1500 people from all over the world joining, will feel as though they can weigh in either with thoughts or observations, or in the case of this conversation, questions. My colleague Liz Mosley is uh, on the chat and is going to uh, try and corral the, uh, the, the, the conversation um, uh, there too. Um, but Nigel, I should also say that there's a, there's a good deal of luck in journalism. And sometimes you plan something for months and then 48 hours beforehand, you get a thunking great news story and you think everything is now AI. And the deep mind development alpha fold, the, the capacity to make such a step change in protein folding. You've now reached, by the way, the outer limits of my understanding of this subject. <laughs> it seems to me one of those moments where AI goes from being the preserve of a small few people who understand its potential to actually all of us seeing that it's going to have a life-changing impact. So, so can we start with where we are this week? What you read alpha fold as meaning, but both for good and bad, what it tells us about the development of AI. Yeah, well, great. And great to be with you, James. Um, I think it's, it, it is a remarkable achievement. And I think uh, partly because as has been widely reported, the challenge of working out how proteins fold, how they configure themselves in three dimensions, um, so as to affect the functions they have in life on Earth. Literally, it's as broad as that. We're all comprised and composed of them. It drives our life processes. That challenge of working out how these structures are arranged in three dimensions, to understand that has been one of the grand challenges of biological sciences. And um, in fact, so hard that in the past, the way you would try and understand the configuration of a particular set of molecular assembly, which to, was to kind of tinker around, examine it with microscopes, various forms of advanced instrumentation, uh, lots of bright biologists looking at this, trying to puzzle it all out. In fact, that was a very slow, laborious process. Uh, and, and as um, DeepMind have noted, uh, a few years ago, we even resorted to crowdsourcing, where thousands, uh, tens of thousands of pairs of eyeballs were put on the problem. People were recruited. Humans do have a remarkable visual ability to work out how things can fold and interlock. It's the kind of uh, 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 skill you see children demonstrating as they work out how to assemble a set of Lego box and work out what the constraints are on putting things together. We are quite good at that. And so recruiting thousands of people to work out this uh, this as a crowdsource game called Fold It um, did actually uh, bring uh, the challenge to quite a broad range of, of, of people outside of the preserves of science. But 
to do it reliably and predictably, this is the great breakthrough, and automatically having trained the system on huge amounts of data uh, are from the data banks that hold uh, protein structures. That's been the great achievement. Uh, the other achievement I should say is all of the data these prodigious machine learning algorithms were trained on was open data. So uh, this was actually quite an important use of a repository of scientific knowledge available to all. And, and, and I wanted to talk about it in those terms, um, I suppose with, with your two different hats on, both with the Open Data Institute, but but then come at it also given your role as, the, uh, as professor of computing science at Oxford. And I wonder whether we can do the open data question first. Um, I, you know, I, I reached adulthood as the internet became available to all of us. And so I was one of those people who bought into the hype of the internet, its potential to democratize things, to empower individuals. And yet, you know, 25, 30 years on, Actually, there are really deep concerns now, aren't there, about the concentration of power in very few hands, the inability of, you know, governments and the world more generally to, to marshal its power for public good. That You'd be forgiven for looking at what Demis Hassabis and his team at DeepMind have said and, and have done and say, as well as this being a wonderful step change, it's a step change that's in the hands of a private enterprise owned by Alphabet, parent company of Google, how worried should we be about the capacity of AI to change our world in ways that we have no, no leverage, no management uh, over? I think that's a, a, it is a concern and um, we need to be mindful of it. But, but just to, to, I think, also emphasize that in the uh, extraordinary progress of both the underlying infrastructure, you know, the internet, the web, the raw computing that's behind all of this. Um, I mean, that, that's that been one of the key elements to success uh, that the electrical engineers who design and uh, implement the chips on which all of this extraordinary software runs is no less extraordinary, the actual hardware. And, and it's that well-known set of laws, Moore's law, Cooper's law, Crider's law, they're all a essentially uh, tell you that capacity, whichever way you look at it, and power is doubling at about every 15 months. And so that's the substrate we're building all of this software on. And then the question is, as, as, as you build new businesses, as you build new products and services, what sorts of concentration occur? What sorts of benefits occur? Well, we see the benefits. Of course, the first internet boom you will remember was presaged with huge amounts of interest in the uh, very early 2000s around uh, this will transform everything. And there just wasn't quite the power and connectivity around then. So lots of promises were made and some things simply fell away. In the meantime, that connectivity of power just kept on going and going and going. We really can deliver, as we are now, extraordinary amounts of real time, point to point video streaming, whatever that might be. Much of it being shaped, interestingly, by machine learning algorithms that works out how to most efficiently direct the traffic. Um, but the question that we worry about is, are there unnatural monopolies beginning to emerge uh, concentrations of power, as you say? And there's two ways that can happen. One is the algorithms themselves, perhaps, and the other is the data that drives the algorithms. I actually think the algorithms, um, the many of the core insights and the fundamental methods and techniques are a matter of public record. They're published out in articles. There are, in fact, uh, environments. Uh, Google themselves have invested very, very large amounts of their resource to produce a, an environment, TensorFlow, which is available for the world of research to use, okay? Um, the real commodity, perhaps in some sense, is the data. Now, in some cases, that data, as I referred to in the, in the alpha fold example, protein folding, is available as uh, publicly accessible data sets. That's often really good for innovation. The bigger worry is in when data has gotten concentrated and the insights are only available to those who have the data. And that, of course, is part of the challenge around the acquisition of huge amounts of our preference data by platforms who gather all our click-throughs when we're using apps on our phone, for example, or the mobile data that uh, telcos have on us, et cetera, our footfall, where we spend our time going back and forth from. So lots and lots of data of that sort where we get a feeling that it's, 
its its concentration is uneven. And uh, that's actually one of the things that the Open Data Institute, which I co-founded with Tim Berners-Lee uh, in 2012, worries about. It's about building a healthy and trusted data ecosystem, which has open data as its foundation layer. And that's not to say that other types of data don't need to be managed and protected in various ways for various reasons, but the foundation should be as open as possible. And uh, the there are a number of questions on there around the ethics of AI that are developing. Um, and the more you look at it, the, 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 the more you realize the sort of easy trolley car arguments are actually, as I said, the, the easy ones. The, the Open Data Institute and the arguments around data feel as though they're also moving into, if you like, the sort of public political bloodstream. People are beginning to realize this issue largely. We, we held a session, one of the work, first sessions we held with our AI network taught us, we invited Mike Lynch in and, you know, from the well, founder of Autonomy. I remember what he said, which, which, which I have to find, say I found quite chilling, which was a different uh, ethical issue and a di different oversight issue, which was, which was, if you like, the black box question. What happens when these computer programs and algorithms are, are developing themselves and therefore you can't predict where they're going to go and potentially you can't even trace back the, the choices they made, the decisions they made to get there. Can you tell us a little bit about how you see that particular problem? Well, I mean, that, that uh, challenge of black box AI, it is an interesting feature of the modern, uh, modern generation of techniques that AI is deploying. I, I would just say at this point as well that AI's toolbox is now quite extensive. You know, it's a, it's a technology that has been around, a science discipline that's been around for um, uh, 60 years, you know, 50 years, depending, 70, I mean, you, you can go right back to the antecedents, back to Alan Turing and the, and, and the Second World War, but thereafter, um, serious uh, effort, efforts and methods and techniques were developed from the 50s onwards. Man, and, and originally, a lot of this was based in, in, in logic-based reasoning or rule-based reasoning. There, you could really get at the explicit representation of knowledge and information and how that was being transmuted. And that first flower, one of the first flowerings of, of AI was uh, the 80s and early 90s, so-called knowledge-based systems, expert systems, where the knowledge bases were represented in this very explicit way. And you could trace the reasoning. You could literally see the invocation of sets of rules. It was um, uh, uh, scrutable. Um, but there's always been a different uh, set of techniques, some of them based uh, fundamentally in statistical methods, where the ensemble of data and the patterns that are being found, and in the case of neural networks, by weight matrices, that these, these large arrays of weights that are being adjusted, huge numbers of these weights being adjusted to look for the patterns in the data. These are black boxes uh, very often. And, and so that I, though there is a, a whole area of research, I should say, in AI that's trying to, um, it's a wonderful uh, term, AI neuroscience. It's the idea that this is now so complex, a bit like the human brain. You've got to develop methods to probe the, the networks to, to find out how they work. And I think that is a challenge. Um, it's not one that the field is unaware of, and there are methods, interestingly, you can overlay on top of these neural networks to try and reconstruct what the segmentation of the problem was, how the system is actually using the cases it's being trained on, what the intermediate steps might be in the network's computations, what sorts of uh, objects of interest are being identified in there. And, uh, and again, uh, people building modern applications will often have a mix of rule-based and the uh, network, neural network-based architectures. But there is a challenge in all of that. I also think there's a challenge though, before we move off that, around the data that is held to feed the network. And if that's not scrutable, of course there the worry is in rampant um, surveillance capitalism where it's certain sort of companies can get all the data that might relate to my preferences, my patterns of life, all sorts of aspects of our society. And it's that concentration, which I as a consumer or as a citizen or groups don't have access to in the same way that the uh, very large um, platforms now do. Nigel, I, I, I want to just bring in Chris Reese because he, as you were speaking, made a point about glass boxes versus black boxes. Um, and I'm always nervous about trying to ventriloquise a question when I don't even understand the terms of art involved. So I thought I'd ask Chris to put the point to you. Chris, will you just explain what you mean? Sure. Uh, I've been exercised 
uh, as Nigel has about the black box problem for a long time. And uh, I've come across this glass box theory in which uh, you build a parallel model of the system that the AI is designed to solve using other techniques uh, which are traceable in the way that Nigel was just describing. Uh, and if you can get the right, the same result, it will be crude, not so precise. You can trace the logic of the glass box and therefore infer the logic of a black box. Yeah, and that's right. I think there are a number uh, of, of methods like this, Chris, that are em emerging. Uh, and, and some will seek to, uh, as I say, um, compartmentalize elements of the black box or segment it in various ways or insert uh, various methods of interrogating the state of this evolving system. Uh, literally like putting the probes into the into into the wetware of our brain to work out what's going on and I think that that is promising and um, uh, we will we're seeing a lot of uh, work on that we're also seeing a lot of work I should say on the attempt to encode structure explicitly into these networks and I think that's uh, that's an area again where many of the applications have succeeded uh, because they have taken the fact that just blindly searching through all sorts of possible permutations for the patterns is, is, is not often very efficient. And we know that in the physical world, structure dominates. So the chemical structures of a compound, or as we now know, the physical structure of proteins, that, that they are organized and constrained by rules of nature. It's to the various assemblages and subcomponents that can arise. It's looking for the larger of patterns and ensembles that's often the challenge in these systems. Nigel, thanks. And Chris, thanks for putting, to it, uh, put, putting that, that point to us. Um, I, I see that um, Frederick Lewis said, you know, who's, um, who's Chris Reese? And, and one of the natures, of the ideas of our thinkings is that they're, they're, they're open meetings. And what we really want to do is make sure that as many people as possible air their thoughts, put their ideas, talk of their own personal experience in conversation with Nigel and with people through the course of the day so do raise a point in the chat and I'll bring you in or, or raise your digital hand and I'll try and do the same um uh, thank you Chris Nigel um in the course of today we're going to look at we're going to go from this session to look at our index we're then going to talk about global competition we're going to talk about talent and talk about ethics and we're going to talk about breakthroughs and I wondered whether you could help us cheat Right. For those people who can't make the whole day, tell us what you think the answers to each of those questions are. <laughs> and starting with the last first, if I might, we, we kicked off with AlphaFold. We, we, one of the last um, uh, sort of business lunches, like dinners I had actually was with Dennis Hassabis and the DeepMind team up the road from here. And at the time we weren't talking about protein folding, we were talking about fusion and you began to see the scale of the things they're working on, you probably have sight of a whole range of different things that are in reach of a breakthrough. What, what do you think we should be looking for in the next, let's say, 12 months to two years? Well, I do think health and life science is going to be a really, um, because it's being accelerated, of course, through the pandemic, um, you're seeing an awful lot of uh, um, uh, 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 developments there. Uh, so drug design um, is very amenable to, um, to uh, AI uh, methods. Uh, the whole area of precision medicine, so how you um, understand how our individual genomes and the protein folding challenge is all part of that, how our individual genomes dispose us to uh, receiving a particular therapy well or not. So I think that whole area of health science is going to be huge. But we also uh, know that uh, we've got opportunities for... Um, uh, breakthroughs in everything, you know, there, there, there's constant work in engineering and design, there's substantial work in, in consumerization of this. The methods often in the background, people don't quite, as I say, understand the extent to which machine learning is being used in so many areas now. Um, and I think it, that brings me back to the question of, you know, talent. Uh, one of our challenges is, is educating at scale people in these literacies and methods. And it's a challenge we have in all of our universities and I would say in our schools. We, we've, we've started to think about how we can make a curriculum fit for purpose, but there is a new kind of literacy um, and that 
data literacy, algorithmic literacy, computational thinking, however you refer to it, is, 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 is to get people to appreciate and understand some of the fundamentals of how this new world is uh, made available and can be exploited. And so we literally have hundreds and hundreds of students here in Oxford who are basically self-improving uh, um, uh, to get hold of these machine learning techniques be, uh, to apply them to their own specific uh, theses, topics of interest. And there simply is a challenge of scaling all of that up in an accessible way. Um, so there's the techniques on the one hand, there's of course all of the ethics and responsible innovation on the other hand, which also has to be taught and embedded into the curriculum. And, and, and Andrew, will you just step back for us, if you like, in terms of where the UK sits? Um, this year has been harder than most to, to look, you know, frankly, beyond your own front door, let alone beyond your own institution. When you look at the UK's record in terms of education and attraction of talent in AI, you know, that's something that I can wrap my head around and understand how we're doing. Do you, do you look at it and think quite promising, something to really worry about. How do we stand vis-a-vis -vis the likes of the US, China, Israel, France, Germany? Look, I think our, 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 our best is, is the best, some of the best there is. I think there's no question about that. It's how broad the pyramid can be made, I think, in, in, in that regard. Um, and I think we have always done pretty well. I mean, retaining talent will be a challenge. Uh, we have an extraordinary record of attracting talent into the UK historically to, uh, to study. We see that in our own department in Oxford in computer science, the numbers of applications per place, where they come from. There's no lack of interest, inbound interest with what we have to offer. Um, you know, and that's the same in, in many of our elite universities and more broadly, I have to say as well, an awareness of, of, of what's important there. So I think we stack up pretty well, again, given the size of our uh, uh, relative economic standing in the world, uh, our capacity is quite good. We often, uh, we would do well to think about what we've done in the past when we've uh, faced these uh, um, kind of uh, situations where uh, capacity doesn't meet demand. And we've engaged a lot in various forms of very useful transfer degrees. So intermediate degrees that allow graduates to move and translate from discipline to discipline. And I think that's something we ought to be looking at very seriously. Numerate individuals of which there are many or people who want to get into the field from other disciplines altogether, to start to stand up the degrees that support that uh, the uh, that that sort of training very important. I think we stand up pretty well, I have to say, um, and I'm not sanguine about that because uh, there's a huge challenge around how we push that down. So we providing a supply of uh, good talent into the universities that can do the training here. And that the, 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 the one thing I, the one thing I'd ask Nigel is I, I find myself as I get older th thinking more and more be careful what you wish for in that you, you spend years saying the politicians don't get it, they don't understand climate, they don't understand technology. Then turns out they quote unquote get it and they keep saying the same thing again and again and again. <laughs> you're not sure they really know what it means. So you're either here these days things that are all about the green uh, industrial revolution, that's one sound like, or digital skills. And when people talk about digital skills, uh, I'm much more interested in what you talk about when you talk about broadening the pyramid. What, what kind of skills do you want and at what different levels are you looking for to be really competitive in this area? Well, people are doing work on this. I mean, there's great work done by the Royal Society that's promoted this whole idea about how we change the curriculum in secondary schools, essentially, you know, and how we build, um, you know, can you redefine what a uh, qualification in computer science looked like or where you don't have the, uh, the space in the curriculum for that? How do you insert good amounts of data literacy and algorithmic awareness, computational thinking into history and geography? All of these subjects now are becoming quantitative as well as qualitative. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is they also need access to great resources like the data to show the examples being run. Human geography in the UK, completely revolutionized by the fact there's large amounts of data that can be analyzed and understood. You can think about it from everything from politics, as I say, through to, 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 to biology and modern chemistry. And, and I think we do need to look in the broad at this. Uh, and to your point exactly, just two years ago, in 2016, I produced a report for the Minister uh, of State 
uh, Joe Johnson, actually, who was Minister of State for Universities and Science, on, uh, on, on, on computer science employability. Because ironically, just that little time ago, people were saying, well, we're training all these computer scientists, but they're not getting in, you know, there's, there's a residual level of unemployment. We looked at the data carefully, it turned out it's how you measured it. Uh, lots of these people went off and spent time before they went re-entered the job market. But it also showed that there is a range of skills that need to be taken account of. And it's not just about the high end developers of the most advanced neural network algorithms. It's also about the people who keep the fundamental uh, data foundries going, the repositories, the server farms. There's a whole skill space, as you say, that needs to be brought now. And by the way, on that, on that, Nigel, is the Open Data Institute, it's not a statutory body. It's a, what it, what no, it's is not. It's actually a company limited by guarantee. It was set up with a grant from government and now uh, gets funding from both commercial, uh, public sector and, um, and philanthropic sources. Right. Uh, and we're, we're quartered down in the knowledge quarter now and about uh, 60 people working on the whole challenge of this equitable and fair uh, data ecosystem and it's really doing important work it's not it's about promoting data literacy it's about promoting open standards even if you dec don't de choose to share your data as openly as you might engineering it with open standards gives you a much stronger capability to innovate and make informed decisions about how you might want to share and we also respect what we call the data spectrum Data may be closed for good reasons, it may be shared for particular purposes, and it may be completely open. And understanding that spectrum and how you have to license and actually make the data accessible is fundamental. And part of the trick there, finally, is, is we're also concerned not just with the technology at the ODI, and check out the ODI website, uh, Open Data Institute website, we're concerned with architectures for institutions. So we think we need, we were very inventive in, 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 uh, in this country uh, a few hundred years ago about inventing the notions of limited companies, of private companies. We did institutional innovation as well as the science and engineering of the day that was driving it and commercial uh, innovations that were driving it. We need new institutions to hold and steward our data in ways that meet public as well as private goods. It's, no, it's so interesting you, you, you say that because as you were talking, David Lane in the chat was, uh, was making the case for dealing with a concentration of power by making platforms inter interoperable. You'll, you'll see what he said in the chat. And at the same time, I saw Ian Duffy making the point that if you want to build specialist knowledge skills, you need to have a foundational uh, education at, at, at secondary school level. Uh, and, and then that third element that you talk about, which is institutional innovation. You know, I remember as a young financial reporter learning the history of the Companies Act and the idea of limited liability, but in return for certain public responsibilities. It does feel like it's a, that's the moment. Uh, and so I wanted, just as I see we're coming to, towards nine o'clock, to ask you one final thing, which is when you look around the world at the countries that have that best mix of competitive dynamism, but uh, public oversight. This, the, the, the conversation we had in one of our um, AR meetings recently was about smart machines for the public good. How, how do you, how do you how, where do you look in the world that you think they're getting that combination of um, computing innovation, technological innovation, and institutional innovation right? Well, I think it's it's a very emerging field, and I don't think anybody has completely resolved this issue. Uh, no, they haven't certainly completely resolved it. Uh, I'm beginning to get into it. I, you know, I, I think the UK stands a very good chance of being highly innovative in this space, partly because we have, uh, you know, the size of our economy is something you get your arms around. We have a regulatory a set of regulators with statutory powers we, uh, who are thinking about innovation. I mean, the idea of regulatory innovation is, for some people, anathema, but I think actually it's one well worth looking at. There have been uh, uh, efforts and the ODI is leading on this whole idea of data institutions to look at how we could set these up and we have some good examples. Um, I mean they're not 
the only ones, uh, but UK Biobank is a great example. Um, and the, the 100,000 Genome Project around these whole ideas of how you can mutualize certain sorts of very sensitive data for wider goods, uh, also being attendant to where the, where the public and the private benefits might be. So I think you will see innovation of this sort beginning to emerge point-wise across different jurisdictions. The interesting question is, which jurisdictions will allow that uh, innovation to flourish. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I revert back to uh, the current Reith lectures. Very interesting. The very first yeah. one yesterday, Carney talking about the concept of, of public purpose as well as uh, private value creation, profit, profit maximization. So I think that that will give us space to think about what's mutualization of data for public as well as private goods mean. And we're seeing that in the way in which some of our data has been used in the health pandemic. Nigel, thank you. Um, we, we're coming to the end of our time. And I, and I know that you're gonna to have to rush on to offer something else. Um, Professor Lucy Huberman just prompted me to ask you about what Tim Berners-Lee and you are working on now. Is there something that, that you're looking at? I know we've heard quite a bit about this sort of on the edges. What, what are yeah, you working Well, the, the thing that we have, Tim has uh, got his uh, 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 a company interrupt and, and, and Tim and I have got a project, a research project based in Oxford with the Oxford Martin School called Ethical uh, Web uh, Architectures, Data and Web Architectures. And there we're trying to think whether we can think about uh, being very disruptive of the existing technical architectural settlement. The idea is that people have think that it's a done deal, you know, you you have to surrender your data to the cloud. And in some sense, the centralization of the web and internet has been a feature that people didn't necessarily anticipate. It's become these much more concentrated uh, uh, loci around the web. Uh, what if you could completely invert that and leave the data much more localized uh, at the point of generation and applications come to the data? Now, that presents all sorts of technical challenges and the uh, the approach behind that, uh, social link data is one such approach, solid. Um, and there are other such methods of developing. I mean, that comes with associated challenges. If you leave all the data in these um, uh, individual repositories, how do you find the patterns across them? And so there is now uh, a set of research, people in my own group working on privacy preserving machine learning, where you can aggregate all of that data together, find the patterns over the joint intersection, but no individual has to surrender all of their data into the central consolidating point. And, and I think we will see uh, technical innovations uh, just because nothing is settled in this world. And at the point at which people look at a dominant model, people say, well, why can't we compute at the edge? Why, can't, why does the data have to go to the center? Why can't we bring the application onto the uh, local platform? Nigel, thank you. Uh, uh, one of my mentors in journalism said one of the things that he admires most is accessible scholarship, and uh, and the, what you've done for us in this um, first half hour of our of our conversation today about AI have actually um, enabled us to access the world that you live in, which uh, I know is is for the most of the time actually d deeply inaccessible to us. So I really uh, appreciate your time. Uh, Sir Nigel Chadbolt, we can't give you a round of applause, but we can wish you a very good day. Very pleasure, Thank you very much indeed.